we wanted to start the summit with uh, what I'm considering to be sort of a super session, not necessarily because it's going to be excellent, but because it's going to be long. Uh, but hopefully it'll be excellent too. But we want to uh, dig into the basics for those of you who are joining us for the first time. And for those of us who have been in the business for a long time, there's always great things that we can glean from the process of looking at the basics. Because sometimes we overlook things or, or there's little nuggets that we haven't thought about or we haven't put it all together. And so we have uh, some incredible panelists that are going to share their experience. Uh, many of them have done a lot of work in full dome production. Uh, some of them have great experience with the IT side of things, with uh, experience using all different kinds of software and the, the pitfalls of those and uh, the stuff that, uh, that has helped uh, save their uh, production schedules and, and budgets. And this is not intended to be a comprehensive in-depth session because each one of us could speak for probably eight hours on the topic and you would all die and we'd have to move your bodies out of here and we don't wanna do that very bad. So um, we're just gonna cover it in about two hours and we're just gonna hit the highlights. But the good news is we've got all kinds of other sessions scheduled throughout the summit which will probe the depths of some of these topics. And if there's some questions that you have, as you're going along that are feeling unanswered, please find one of us and we'll do our best to say, I have no clue what you are asking, but you know, we'll do our best to answer it. Um, but we'll make up something that sounds good. No, we'll, we'll do our best to, to try to help you. So we've divided this session into five parts. So this is kind of like uh, a mini series. So the first episode is uh, the essential qualities and what makes Full Dome unique. And so for this first part, uh, Dan and Ryan and I are gonna walk you through kind of our perspective on the qualities that separate full dome from any other medium. And that's really important to kind of orient ourselves to because it is a unique medium with its own way of communicating. And if we approach it like television only or like cinema only uh, or like radio, why would you do that? But it, you know, you, you, uh, you're you missing the qualities that make the medium really work in its sweet spot. And so uh, I want to turn things over to Dan because he's going to give us our first set of slides and then Ryan's going to come up and talk to us about a few more ideas and then I'm going to wrap this part up and then we'll go into part two. So we've got um, 15 minutes to do this, guys. So let's see how we do. Dan, you're up. <clears throat> it's just down to get to the next one. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, yes, eight hours at a minimum. Um, any of us talking on this stuff? Those of you who have tolerated my unending soapbox about this medium know where we're at. Can we do this quickly? I think so. We'll do that. So for the very beginning, let's start with what full dome is not. Full dome isn't a flat screen. Think about that. That's probably my most common comment to producers about this business. When they're moving into the dome, you cannot think flat anymore. It isn't a partial hemisphere. It's a whole hemisphere. It's not commonly a full sphere, but we're headed that direction, and full spheres have been done. It isn't Cinerama, but almost, and it isn't film. What it is, is full dome. That means, obviously, thanks to the namers of this medium, it's the full dome. It covers the entire thing. The graphic in the center there, I'm not sure if I have a graphic capability or not. Does that show? Nope, no pointer there, that's all right. Um, in, in the top center is the, the IMAX film, and you see the black gap to the back. We occasionally do the black gap in the back, but it doesn't qualify as full dome in, in the way we're using the vocabulary. It also covers the full field of vision. This is really important. That means periphery this way, periphery this way, based on human perception or bandwidth of perception, both acoustically and visually for a spherical experience. The dome itself, an iconic structure, um, history goes way back. And the idea is that the domes from the outside are inviting, be it a, a small hut or a giant 40-footer out in a parking lot. People are attracted to these things. Once inside, it surrounds the audience. They're immediately aware of it, typically through sensory deprivation. That is, the outside world influences of noise, traffic, sound, or whatnot are not happening. And through that, it amplifies your awareness. So you're much more aware of changes in light, dark, sound, and position just based on the architectural 
um, aspects of the theater. And that combination hopefully evokes a, a positive, strong emotional response. The Fulton world is a range of different kinds of architecture. This is an ongoing problem. We're not here to solve it by any stretch. What we're looking for is to recognize particular architectural challenges that we want to move away from and look for what's common between these designs so the content makes sense as we move between the venues. Particular challenge is the seating and the, 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 the lean back of the chair and where you're looking on the dome. Um, we're making headway, but the point is to pay attention to it. The size of the dome itself very much changes the experience, and the gain of the screen is becoming a more and more important aspect to consider. Reinforcing the point, nearly every full dome installation is unique. Every single theater to this date has something about it that's a little bit different. Hopefully, through our efforts here, we're going to start to coalesce to um, a higher degree of commonality. So with that, we do have a lot of commonality, and this is what is really the, the decade plus 15 years now, where we at? about 15 years, of having a transfer mechanism using something called the Dome Master. The Dome Original is another phrase, and both of those make sense. The top right graphic there with the green circle demonstrates the, the math algorithm for taking something flat, stretching it on the screen, or more than the whole screen, we have that in place. And the bottom graphic there demonstrates uh, kind of what can happen when you transfer that, that flat to the screen. It's, it's a very different thing. So this is a, just a, a beautiful graphic there, kind of visually representing the, the algorithm between the flat and the curve. Um, I reference these quite often just to, to really picture what's going on with uh, the projection up in the full dome. Different ways to accomplish that, a single lens, or I'm sorry, a single projector, uh, fisheye style, or multiples and the bottom right image there of a, a very clever hybrid of no lens at all doing the work. It's bouncing off a convex mirror to cover the entire dome. So our next challenge is the slice, die, split, and encode aspect of the medium. This one, once you move away from the interchange dome master format and go to each venue accommodating those slides or those, those single frames, it turns to chaos. Many, many variations of sizes, frame rates, and channels. Again, ongoing conversations about that. And 3D. 3D works really well in a dome. We figured it out. It's amazing. That said, it comes with all of the challenges of glasses doubling our work, where you're sitting in the theater, whether the content is designed for looking good 3D in the dome. But the point is, it can work. And in certain situations, it's, it's, it's um, preferable. I argue strongly, from a practical sense and an operator, that the dome already exhibits a really strong 3D effect with no glasses. I almost made t-shirts up that say, look ma, no goggles. Next year, we'll make that happen. The tricks for that 3D perception are based on high contrast ratio and the brightness that triggers um, in, in, in the design your ability to not reference the space and, and the objects have a 3D aspect. Um, parallax, the composition, the context of the scene, and literally being immersed in the story, all of those are strong, strong 3D triggers. Another image that I just call up here is the habit for many newcomers to the field to do everything um, based on the center. I call it kind of a kaleidoscopic or center-based effect. If we look at the, the work and the work we prefer, you'll find there's not a, a centric aspect to the screen at the center of the, the circle. It's lower. And these just kind of demonstrate, uh, we look at the, the, the sweet spot of the image. Um, these are not concentric. They're oriented in a particular way, have a particular view spot. So types of immersive media. Um, some of these we can start to say with you guys, so I've got to move here quick. We don't have much time. But there's overlap between full dome, uh, Oculus Rift, VR, 3D stereo, theme entertainment, other future industries. There's uh, an overlap we'll be exploring here also. Common qualities between all of these, the trigger of course a sense of presence, the uh, immediacy of time and, and the change and shifting of time that happen in that, the heightened realism, and hopefully the theatrical qualities are shared, um, good or bad, in, in all of those playback formats. There we are. Good, good, good. Thank you very much, and we'll segue to next. Ryan. So um, fundamentally, I really just want to make kind of one point, uh, which is that 
the nature of these immersive media really is, uh, is that you're asking the viewer uh, to do a lot of work. Uh, and, I, and basically, you can talk about this in terms of cognitive load. I mean, at any given moment, we're processing uh, the information that comes into us through all our senses. And we, our brains have evolved to be able to kind of minimize the impact. We don't have to, we don't process every photon coming into our eyes. We, we actually uh, are very uh, efficient about the way we, we think about things. But when you're, when you're immersing in an audience, whether it's with these various technologies or more particularly these immersive dome experiences, in a visual space, and the imagery is filling your field of view, you're creating a very sort of cognitive heavy experience. And when you add to that, uh, not just trying to absorb the visuals, but also uh, the soundtrack, the soundscape, the, uh, the narration, if you actually have a show where you want someone to potentially learn something, then all of these things really increase that cognitive load. And you really need to respect that. And, and the way that I typically talk about, about doing this is in terms of, of structuring these experiences of, as narrative journeys. You're really, and, and this relates a lot to, to Ben Shedd's work uh, in describing uh, how immersive experiences shift the action from the screen into the, the brain of the person watching the experience. It's really an embodied experience in a way that watching a film really isn't. So I tend to talk about this in terms of narrative journeys, so that you're actually moving an audience, or you, you, you're, you're transitioning an audience through these scenes and environments. And, uh, and, and throughout that process, uh, just respect your audience members' brains, the cognitive load, the, the, the information and the sensory input that they're dealing with. And so uh, it's a reason that, I mean, I tend to be a little more hardcore about this than some people, but maintaining camera motion so that you always have a three-dimensional sense is kind of an, an aesthetic approach, but it also allows uh, you to really understand where you are in a scene. Uh, maintaining uh, nice long camera moves is, is something that I like, but it does, I think one thing that's clear is that, that abrupt cuts are very jarring. I think we saw, actually last night, if you saw the fragments piece, uh, that uses that that uh, disjointedness to good effect, um, but it is a it's a difficult piece to watch in many ways because of the discontinuities in uh, space and time that you're experiencing uh, in that in that piece, and and for um, particularly for a more didactic experience, I think we uh, we really need to be a little more respectful of our audience in terms of being able to uh, take them on a journey and uh, and and give them something that uh, they can appreciate and absorb uh, without uh, sort of too much stress. So that's really the only point I wanted to make before I turn things over to Michael. Thanks, Ryan. A few other things to keep in mind. Um, and, and Ryan is completely right, and I agree with what Dan was saying as well. This is, it's a big space, and you really are transported inside of that space as the audience, and it's a little bit unusual, in some cases uncomfortable, and we've all experienced, if we've ever been to a full dome film festival where we've just screened content after content, it doesn't matter how good it is, your brain can only take so much, and I find myself going to sleep, not because I don't like it, but it's just, you know, it's, it's almost a defense mechanism. So it's, it's a very powerful thing that, that you're engaging with, and so you have to respect how that works. And the screen is enormous. Even a small dome, if you would flatten that out, and stretch that out, it would be much larger than this screen. In fact, in many cases, it's larger than an IMAX screen. And so you've got a lot of real estate that you're using to communicate to the audience. And the audiences need time to absorb what they're seeing. And like Ryan said, you can use cuts to an effect to try to purposely disorient people or to um, jar them into the next experience. But in a lot of ways, immersive media is a lot more like theater. You have to think of what you can do on a stage and what you have in the real estate that's available to you. You can't just jump from one scene to another scene without a scene change or without something happening. And so it's the same kind of idea. Yes, you can use those traditional cinematic tools to change the perspective, but know that when you're doing that, you're breaking the natural comfort of what that space is all about. So you have to know when to use the transitions and when not to use the transitions and when to keep things flowing and keep people oriented. And the frame is big, like I said, and there's no edge to it where it nicely contains the image 
like in cinema. There's no close-up, really. Uh, there's, there's a way you can sort of do that, but as far as the, the wide shot, medium shot, close-up, vernacular of cutting, it doesn't apply, really, because there's so much stuff that is distracting around that image. It's hard to focus in on a tight close-up with everything blurred out in the background. You never see that in the dome, or you rarely see it in the dome, because the rest of the world is around you. You don't see that in your life, either. So it's a more realistic view of how we appreciate and walk through life. So you have to find other techniques to make it work. It also transports the audience, like Ryan said, inside the experience. It's, it's an embodied experience where the person is in this environment. I, I always used to refer to it and still do as the closest thing we have to the holodeck from Star Trek because you are in this new environment and you have to as an audience member, explore this, this place, and you're guided by the filmmaker. And just like if you're on a, a tour of London or a tour of Paris or whatever, if somebody experienced knows that place, and they're guiding you through, and it adds to your enjoyment. If you're just there by yourself, you might miss some of the important things. And so as a filmmaker, we have to guide people through that. We wanted to start the summit with uh, what I'm considering to be sort of a super session, not necessarily because it's going to be excellent, but because it's going to be long. Uh, but hopefully it'll be excellent too. But we want to uh, dig into the basics for those of you who are joining us for the first time. And for those of us who have been in the business for a long time, there's always great things that we can glean from the process of looking at the basics because sometimes we overlook things or, or there's little nuggets that we haven't thought about or we haven't put it all together. And so we have uh, some incredible panelists that are going to share their experience. Uh, many of them have done a lot of work in full dome production. Uh, some of them have great experience with the IT side of things, with uh, experience using all different kinds of software and the, the pitfalls of those and uh, the stuff that, uh, that has helped uh, save their uh, production schedules and, and budgets. And this is not intended to be a comprehensive, in-depth session because each one of us could speak for probably eight hours on the topic and you would all die and we'd have to move your bodies out of here and we don't want to do that very bad. So um, we're just going to cover it in about two hours and we're just going to hit the highlights. But the good news is we've got all kinds of other sessions scheduled throughout the summit which will probe the depths of some of these topics. And if there's some questions that you have, as you're going along that are feeling unanswered, please find one of us and we'll do our best to say, I have no clue what you are asking, but you know, we'll do our best to answer it. Um, we'll, we'll make up something that sounds good. No, we'll, we'll do our best to, to try to help you. So we've divided this session into five parts. So this is kind of like uh, a mini series. So the first episode is uh, the essential qualities and what makes Full Dome unique. And so for this first part, uh, Dan and Ryan and I are gonna walk you through kind of our perspective on the qualities that separate full dome from any other medium. And that's really important to kind of orient ourselves to because it is a unique medium with its own way of communicating. And if we approach it like television only or like cinema only uh, or like radio, why would you do that? But it, you know, you, you, uh, you're you missing the qualities that make the medium really work in its sweet spot. And so uh, I want to turn things over to Dan because he's going to give us our first set of slides and then Ryan's going to come up and talk to us about a few more ideas and then I'm going to wrap this part up and then we'll go into part two. So we've got um, 15 minutes to do this, guys. So let's see how we do. Dan, you're up. And it's just down to get to the next slide. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, yes, eight hours at a minimum. Um, any of us talking on this stuff? Those of you who have tolerated my unending soapbox about this medium know where we're at. Can we do this quickly? I think so. We'll do that. So for the very beginning, let's start with what full dome is not. Full dome isn't a flat screen. Think about that. That's probably my most common comment to producers about this business. When they're moving into the dome, you cannot think flat anymore. It isn't a partial hemisphere. It's a whole hemisphere. It's 
not commonly a full sphere, but we're headed that direction, and full spheres have been done. It isn't Cinerama, but almost, and it isn't film. What it is, is full dome. That means, obviously, thanks to... <laughs> Okay, we could watch that all day. <laughs> but if you noticed, the space is defined by the placement of the camera, the cinematography, the movement on the screen, and there are just a lot of amazing edits that focus your attention on specific details of a scene. It is very difficult to do that in a full dome environment because the screen is so big and you can't just bring things down like that. You disorient people. and so. One of the most amazing experiences that I had last year in cinema is, is watching the film Gravity. Not because I thought it was the greatest film in the world. It had its, its own set of problems, and I won't get into all that. But what I said when I walked away from it is this is the first time a film has been created with the language of Full Dome. Watch this clip. Calls. She uh, took off in your 74 GTO. Engineering requests fuel status on the jetpack prototype. Five hours off the reservation, and I show 30% drain. Give my compliments to engineering. Except for a slight malfunction in the knowing of the roll axis, this jet back is one prime piece of thrust. Engineering says thank you. Tell him I still prefer my 67 Corvette, though. Speaking of which, did I ever tell We know the Corvette story, Matt. Even engineering? Especially engineering. We're going to miss you, Matt. Comms card reboot in progress. Thank you, Doctor. Sharif, what's your status? Nearly there. Replacing battery module A1 and C. Uh, could you be a little more specific? Indeterminate estimates make Houston anxious. No, 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 Houston. Don't be anxious. Anxiety is not good for the heart. System is ready to reactivate. Hubble telescope engaged. Upgrade fully functional. That applause you hear is for you, Sharif. Congratulations. Kick back, take the rest of the day off. <laughs> Matt, do you have a visual on just what mission specialist Sharif is doing up there? He appears to be doing some form of the Macarena. Or that would be just a best guess scenario on my part. Dr. Stone, Houston. Medical now have you with a temperature drop to 35.9 and a heart. Okay, so as you notice, that was one shot. And the shot developed as the camera moved around the scene. And that is something that we do a lot in Digital Full Dome. And you'll see that tonight in some of the examples that we're going to watch in the theater. And so there's a different approach. And if you saw Birdman this year, that film was mostly one shot. And it won Best Picture, and it won Best Cinematography. And it was a very bold experiment. And so. Filmmakers are starting to think in terms of longer developed shots, and that works very naturally in our medium. So um, we're going to turn things over to the panelists. We're going to we're going to ask some questions, and uh, I'm going to have Annette answer the the first uh, question. But here, once again, are our panelists: Annette, Isabella. They're they're almost in order. That's great. And Tom on the end, and then Robin. So the first question I have: Yes, Dan. I have one very quick comment. Oh. that I want to make not only to, to this panel group, but to all of the speakers coming in. We went to great effort to choose our, our favorites and our friends and people that are ex expert. And particularly on this group, these folks went to great expense on their own and great effort for their five minutes of fame up here. So thank you all very much. Yes, thank you. OK, so my first question for the panel, and we're going to start with Annette answering this because she has some slides prepared. How do you direct the visual experience for the audience since standard composition cues and editing cues don't apply? So Annette, come on up. Hi. Well, first of all, um, I have no experience as a flat screen director, so I have no preconceptions at all. So um, I'm just going to talk primarily about um, about uh, directing for Full Dome. And I just want to start with um, the fact that I am actually a unidirectional theatre director, not a concentric theatre director. And I, there is a difference. And I am not qualified to talk about um, concentric 
direction. I think it's a different ball game, and I hope somebody has a chance to mention that and talk about that today. So with unidirectional, um, this is my um, comfort zone. Um, this is a, a, an average type of dome. It's about 20 degrees, and um, I, I tend to, to work, obviously, with um, visuals front-facing. So if you look at, um, at this, this is actually my chart, so don't use it as a standard. I actually just sat in, the, in, in our dome in Nashville, which is actually flat, and then measured it with my own eyes and came up with this. So most of my storytelling is actually... Um, fixed mostly to the main, the main field of view for the audience as they're all facing forward. Obviously, with a different tilt, that changes. Um, but the periphery is, is what it is. And um, I, I typically try and move the audience's eyes through the periphery and into the extended periphery, always coming back to the main field of view. So that might be handy um, for others to take into consideration when, um, when practicing this if they're a newcomer. Um, some of this we've already covered, I think, in the earlier presentation, um, and so I'm just going to brush over it. Um, I can't actually see it. Um, what I'm going to do is just concentrate um, primarily on... Um, I can't actually see it. Uh, just leading the eye in and out of the main field of view. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to bring to the table today, because um, there's a lot of the other stuff's going to be co covered by other panel members. So, um, sorry. Yeah, it's just me. You can skip that. That's, that's the weird looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Is this, are these my slides? Hang on. Stand by. Your slides are here. Should be here. Oh, wow. <laughs> they should be. But um, dang it! Somehow they got they got lost. I stand by. No panic. Da, da, da. Maybe I have a topic. I can wing it. Oh, I'm sorry, Annette. That's I put okay. them in, and then in one of the versions they went away. So. Or you can just slap me with it. Um, shoot. Hello. Is it working? Is it working? And something strange happened, so I don't know where we are. <laughs> ah, no, we're good. Okay, so I, I don't know where they went, Annette, but I did put them in, and now they're gone. So do you want to just wing it? I'm sorry. I'll just wing it. Okay, um, the next slide was actually going to talk about what I, do, I, I, I don't actually do. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it was all uh, mainly about fast cutting and so forth, and I think other people are going to be talking about that, so I'll brush over that. But what I want to concentrate on is that I think what's really important, uh, again, about this medium is it's a theatrical medium. It, it isn't flat screen. And one of the, uh, when I first came into the game, as it were, um, what really intrigued me, what I found was a real wow, was when I saw an optomechanical projector actually raising from the center of the theater, and, and we've lost that theater. So um, with my f uh, newest production to Space and Back, I wanted to bring some of that back, some of that wow. And I chose to create um, visuals to represent a hologram. And we're going we're gonna to show that in a minute so you can actually see how, um, how, how we're trying to bring three dimension into the theater as opposed to flatten the screen. So if we want to just roll that, is it going to roll? Oh, that's, 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 what, that's the part that I messed up because I'm... Just keep talking, I'll see if I can find it. So, sorry. Okay, so, um, so primarily I, I actually work in stereo, so I think stereo. Um, my movements are pretty slow. Um, I actually really considered going from one environment to another so as not to cause headaches and break the stereo. So you'll find this, these next examples of work fairly slow. It's actually a truncated um, vision, uh, a visual, which means we've chopped off the top of the polar image to just try and bring it to magnify it a little bit so you can see the main field of view. And I can't dance, so I can't dance. <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> can't sing. <laughs> Do you remember what you named the files? I just make animation. Do you remember what you named the files? Immersa. <laughs> oh, wow. There'll be, there'll be nothing on immersa, uh, Two, called Immersa on my drive 2015. at all. 2015. Oh, 2015. That narrows it down. Good. I think it might have said A Barnett on it. We could come back to me. It might be tomorrow. <laughs> Hang on. I do actually need the film to just demonstrate some of my points, otherwise it won't make sense. I think it's hard to visualize, I imagine what I'm talking about, so. Um, Ooh, look at this. 
Hold on. This Pardon? might be it. Hold on. No, it was all downloaded. It might be yeah. here. We're waiting for PowerPoint. So let me just give you a word of advice. If you ever raise your hand and say, oh, I'll put the PowerPoint presentation together at the very end, say no, because everybody will be mad at you. There's no win. Uh, this might be what you sent me. Anyway, just about just a little bit about what we're hopefully going to see. Um, to space them back, some of you might have seen it. It premiered in 8K at Fisk last, last year. Its target audience is between 10 and 12 years old. Um, and I really try to think about what's cool for them. You know, what's going to make a difference? Why? M my job is to sell science. It's as simple as that. I'm a commercial artist. I sell science. Um, so I, you know, I want them to go out of the theatre. You know thinking that was a really, really cool, wow experience. So I try to work with that in mind, and knowing your audience is really important. So I do spend a lot of time talking to kids. Um, as I say, the next scene, um, you know, kind of took the hologram idea, brought it in the room. It's a pricey, I mean, you only seen a tiny bit, but it's a pricey of our achievements in space over the last few decades. And I wanted to do it in, 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 in an imaginative and quick way to, to, um, to bring it all together. Uh, see, this doesn't have... This doesn't have the videos either. No, it was sent by a Dropbox. Um, oh, okay. You said you had it. I did. I did have it. And, and it then played it all fine. changed. It did, and it did play fine. It was so good. <laughs> we worked really hard on it. I know you did. Just no, no. <laughs> no, in case you're wondering, I already feel bad. But now I really feel bad, so. <laughs> mm hmm. I have an idea. Do you have an idea? Go Why ahead. Why don't we move on? Let's move on. And then we'll do a break. You find it, and then maybe I'll just play at the beginning of the next. That sounds session. good. Let's do that. Uh, my, my sincere apologies, everyone. All right. She's turning off the microphone. <laughs> she's had enough. <laughs> I don't blame her. <laughs> yeah, right. She's she's done. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's open up that same question to uh, the rest of the panel. Um, I think Tom wanted to talk a little bit about directing the visual experience. So uh, come on up. I've got one of your slides until it, until it turns out that I don't, but I do have it. There you go. I know. I did everything. Okay. So um, I come from the television world, and uh, that's flat screen, and I spent uh, half a career making TV shows. So when I come into the full dome area, um, I look at it and I have a different, slightly different point of view, which is that um, I say, I looked, you know, from first impressions when I started seeing full dome shows uh, over 10 years ago, my impression was all the rules that I learned still apply. Uh, we, can, we can use cuts, <coughs> we can use dissolves, we can use tracking shots, uh, we can use parallel action. Uh, we can do everything that we have been doing on the dome. And in fact, a lot of things that we were doing in TV, uh, you know, we're still doing on the dome. Uh, and so my point of view is that story is everything. And you start with that. <clears throat> and uh, audience experience is also up there. So uh, you want to, in a sense, kind of cast a spell on people. Uh, you want to draw them in and you don't want to let them go. You want to, you want to uh, not so much respect the brain, but challenge the brain and stimulate them and give them an experience that they're, they're going to take away that's going to be very memorable. So in the service of the story, uh, I like cuts. Uh, on TV, you don't want cuts to be jarring, uh, and the same in the dome. And so you do it, you work with it in the same way. And in fact, TVs are getting larger, so the jarring cuts, you know, uh, are more jarring, and uh, you know they're even more jarring up here. So you have to you have to work them carefully. Uh, they have to maintain screen direction. Uh, you have to orient people in space, uh, and uh, you have to draw them in, draw them along. So that's so that's that's my basic thing. Uh, now, Ryan mentioned the word narrative journey, and I've also heard you say virtual journey. So I took that and put it up here. Uh, but that's kind of the, the stock and trade of the, 
of a full dome, which is that the traditional kind of sequence scene shot uh, is com can be compressed into one, and uh, and that's where the ca the the spell gets cast, I think, where you're you're taking people into a world that's evolving, that's moving in front of them, that's changing, and you're trying to mesmerize them. Uh, with sight and sound, and draw them into the, into and through the story, uh, and so um, you know I want to give them wild rides. Uh, I want to make them grip their seats, uh, and I want them to look around and explore what they're seeing. And you know if they haven't seen everything, uh, they can come back, and hopefully they do. You know there's a, a, a memorable experience I had with one of Ryan's film called Life, I think, which is, uh, we saw it at the uh, Denver Museum, and it's this long track up through the, through the Redwood Forest. And off to the left is this little squirrel. And, uh, and I just couldn't help but look at it, watch it. And I had to kind of keep my eye on the general action, but that's what got my attention. That's what I was interested in. And I uh, followed the story, of course, as well. Uh, but that's the, that's the potential, is that you can give people a lot to look at. You can really stimulate them. And, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's not so much about the grammar and the specifics of it. It's about the, the whole experience. And, and it's the story that you want them to go into and forget where they are and just uh, experience it. And the, the other thing about the narrative journey is that you can also tell a story within a story. So uh, this works especially with uh, uh, data visualizations, where uh, the data was assembled in the first place to, st uh, to tell a story, to answer a question. And so you can let it unfold and let the, let the action uh, tell the story. And then the, uh, the visualization is to, is to follow it and uh, to its conclusion. And, uh, and then it's a, and then you fold those stories within the story into the larger story, and hopefully take people gracefully from one to the next. So I'll let someone else talk. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. That's an important concept because story is really what it comes back down to in all media. Because as humans, we are storytellers. Back to the days when we would sit around campfires and telling stories. I'm not a camper, so I can't relate. But um, people love a great story. And if we can capture that within this medium, then we've done our job. And there's some amazing ways to do that. In fact, Isabella has a, a, some slides about how she transitions between scenes. And here's a, a great example of, of one uh, powerful way to do that. So Isabella, come on up. Okay, so hello everybody. I have a little bit of a cold, so I hope you can understand me. Um, okay, I have three minutes to get that across, um, which is um, I would like to start not to look into the dome so much, but around it, what's happening there and how our audiences are changing as well, how, like how their whole mindsets are changing because they use the media what, which they use, like iPhones and mobiles, navigation tools. So we live in a fast-paced world. Um, so the Earth surface maps can be generated frequently and on demand. So what I do instantly, and you probably maybe as well, I would look up a destination, I would create the map, the path to get there, and as soon as I'm there, I will delete it. So what we do, we generate and delete, we generate and delete. And somehow this whole cartography and maps lost their value. But there was a time um, where cartography was magnificent. It was a tool of power that illustrated spatial knowledge. And I believe that one of the values of immersion of our film theater is to bring back that magnificency. So what I did, I looked into the zooms onto the Earth's surface from my own productions, but also from others. And what I realized that we kind of tend 
to make the time span of that you know, particular zoom into shorter and shorter. Um, and I'm including myself as well. Um, do we really want that? Um, that will be a question. And um, we would use what we do. We, we use a sphere. We map satellite images to it. We build a nice texture. And then we will go into it. And then we would dissolve into our 3D scene. So somehow we swoosh our audiences to the place we want them to localize. And um, maybe we do that because we have a digital universe atlas, but we don't have a digital Earth atlas with all the volumetric data and everything that we would like to have there. So, you know, we still would build our own 3D scenes, right? Um, so what I, what I did, I um, looked uh, into some of the older concepts, for example, of Powers of Ten. I don't know if you remember that movie, right, in the 1960s. And, um, well, the, you know, the realization was really rudimentary, right? So they had the magnitude of 10, and they would think of, you know, they would take still images, you know, to, to um, make the notion of a travel, of a journey from the micro to the macro levels. But um, when I looked at into their concept, they had up to, you know, to go from um, from Earth, like how we used to see it in space, to the hand of the man that is, you know, lying at that Michigan lake. Um, they used nine nine stages, nine images, and all 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 of these images had like, um, you know, specific information that they collected in it. So how much of that have we lost uh, while we are, you know, doing our software? tools and, you know, 3D animations is something to think of. Um, some of that rules, right, have been um, integrated into the digi digital universe atlas, as we know. Um, but how about going backwards? So how going back into the microscopic world, which is way more difficult, right? Because um, we don't have, you know, digital atlas of the microscopy. So what we will do, we will build our own you know, worlds of that. And um, so what will be the solution um, to go here? And uh, what I found was one really, really fantastic, and I had conversations with Dan about it as well. Um, it was this, um, I think, really clever usage of the immersion. Because, you know, the, the concept is so brilliant, but we have now, like, all these capabilities of the new technology, immersion, 360 degrees. So how we should use the 360 degrees to do the shrinking or the zooming or the transition into the microscopy worlds. And um, so this is, for example, one answer. So, uh, you know, this particular spiral movement that we have in that shot from all we are that it was done at the Visualisierung Center in our shopping and directed, I think, from Kat Emmert. Um, so we were spiraling, you know, using the 360 degree surface have reference points, so seeing still a cup of coffee, coffee bean, etc. So we were shrinking down to the sizes and keeping the relation of scale and not get lost our audiences in that whole, you know, new world. That is one one example that I want to mention. And the other one was uh, from uh, is from Dream to Fly, which I was happy to be part of, um, and it was the transition uh, that was chosen for also a spiral link as a transition to drag the audience deeper into, into that experience and here to you know, eventually arrive at the workspace of Leonardo da Vinci. So transitions are an important uh, thing to do in this medium. So that was some focus of my so. So next, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Robin to, to speak to us. Uh, Robin has done some really innovative work uh, in the medium, and uh, I want to ask him specifically about lessons he's learned uh, through this experience of uh, doing multiple films in the digital full dome format, and uh, what you've taken away from that, what you'd want to do next, what you'd do different if you could, and, and what you're really excited that, that you were able to pull off. So come on up. Yeah, so I get to talk about what went wrong, and uh, so so lessons learned. Um, if you look at our last film, uh, basically I learned that we didn't look enough at Hollywood. I, I think we're like 
at least eight years behind with technology on Hollywood. And, and even if we use the technology, we use it a lot poorer um, than Hollywood did. It, there was a movie, King Kong, in 2005, um, which was amazing as far as graphics. And um, it was all green screen. And, uh, but I think um, so in some scenes, the audience would lose uh, the believability that these actors were really there. But if you would just judge that film on the computer graphics, it's, it's still amazing today. But if you have a lot of moments where you lose um, this believability, then people stop uh, following the story. And, and I think we did the same uh, to an extent in Dinosaurs at Dusk. My, my rule of thumb there was we build a big green screen. We uh, have an actor-driven show where anything they touch should be real, like they touch a telescope. But anything that they don't touch can be CG. And then, of course, you have a, we had a very good lighting guy, but still, um, um, there's 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 moments where, or a lot of moments, uh, depend on you, where uh, where you don't believe that the actors are really there, especially when you see their feet, and it gets worse in 3D, uh, where you know you film with a, a the, the the environment with a with a CG fisheye lens, and you film the actors with a real fisheye lens, and they're already two different lenses, and you have different lighting. And um, so that's, so basically, I mean, in Hollywood, they're getting back to now um, using more uh, real sets and use CG where it really uh, is necessary, uh, like Interstellar, for example, where they, they, they just hang, hang a real spacecraft from a crane over a, over a lake or, or what have you. And um, it all has to do with lighting. So we, basically what we learn is we should learn more from, from Hollywood because our, our films start to look a little bit more like, our documentaries start to look more like films and people unfortunately start to judge them as films. And it's the same people go to a movie theater as going to the planetarium. So we have to have to kind of see what, what the, the new trends are um, and, uh, and not go eight years back in time. Um, now, as far as transitions, I think uh, if I can add something to that, I mean, we've done both. We made natural selection where the first nine minutes is one shot and most people remember that shot, and that's of course also because it's 25% of the film. Um, and in Dinosaurs, we did it different. Everything is a cut or a crossfade. It's also necessary because we, we're jumping in time. And I mean, if you have an immersive experience, you always have to walk or fly somewhere else, and you don't have time for all that. Uh, it's, it, there's also different moments in time. So you have to start using cuts and crossfades, which is fine in full dome. But if you do that, you probably have to pay more attention to the length of the of the shots. You know, people need some time to to look around where they are now, and you cannot cut as fast as as a Coca-Cola commercial. Um, so, and and in Dinosaurs, there was so much happening in that film. I wanted to make it 41 minutes, and it ended up being 44, um, indicating already that we yeah uh, we had a lot to say. Um, so some shots might 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 have been nicer to do it a little bit longer, and that's what we're going to do with our next film. We're going to be might make a bit of a hybrid between these nice long shots and spend some more time in a set. Spend some more time in enjoying the set because that's what the full dome medium is so good at in enjoying vistas. Okay. So that's kind of like what I'd like to add. Excellent, thanks. Okay, we're about to part three, but I wanted to go off book just for a second. I just wanted to ask a quick question of the panelists for part two. And the question is, what do you love about this medium? And just a uh, real quick. Mm, I think to embrace um, the audiences in the sceneries that we built. I think full dome is the first time you walk in a full dome theater is like walking into a, a cathedral, walking into St. Paul's or St. Peter. And, and so we're like uh, having the chance of doing the paintings on, on the roofs of these modern cathedrals. And that, that's what I like about it. Yeah. I'll offer another point of view. Uh, uh, having worked in television for a long time, the thing that I really, really love about Full Dome is the collaborations that, that we get working. And uh, I have yet to see anybody stamping their feet or yelling or accusing or getting mad or threatening or anything like that. You see that all the time in television. But in Full Dome, you don't see that. It's uh, it's everybody is everybody is really happy to you know join the fun. So and don't start. <laughs> don't start, Mike. <laughs> Annette hasn't left. She's still here. 
I'd agree with Tom on that. I used to work in television too, and it, yes, it is the rat race. <laughs> um, I, I, I think um, the look on kids' face, I mean, I actually have the ability to see what the, the, the look on kids' faces when they're transported to different worlds, and I, I don't think you can get that from any other medium as well as, as you can get from that. Thanks very much, that was a lot of fun. Okay, let's trans transition into part three. And uh, Brad Thompson is our um, producer for this part. So Brad, come on up. All right, welcome Brad, come on, give it up. Hello everybody, uh, arrow keys to move around, okay. Oh, I even get to see the next page, that's nice. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm Brad Thompson. Uh, this, this section we're gonna talk about the technical workflow for full dome production. So I, I love all the story stuff that we've been talking about, but uh, it, in order to actually produce this stuff, you, you kind of have to know the, the, the tech side of things. So uh, we have a few panelists that we're, we're gonna we're gonna, this is gonna be a little bit different than the last one. It's not gonna be quite so linear. We're gonna jump around from person to person. So uh, apologies for the, the, the change around. But uh, we've got Paul Mowbray from NSC, uh, Ryan Wyatt from the California Academy, uh, me and Robin Sipp. And I'm gonna lead things off. Uh, the, the Dome Master was introduced to you earlier uh, by Dan. This is what it looks like. So that when we're producing for Full Dome, uh, from a technical standpoint, this is what we are creating. This is what we're interested in creating. And the way this works is, if you imagine it like a, like a bowl, like push this, this, where it says zenith, push that forward, grab it, and put it over your head like this, that's how it maps to the dome. So uh, the bottom is the front, the center is the zenith that's directly above you, the back is behind you, the right's the right, the left's the left. And that's what we are creating. This is the typical production pipeline. I'm not really gonna spend any time on this uh, because our time is short. And really, from a technical standpoint, what we're focused on out of this is the, the production and shot post-production and editing. So I'm not gonna go through all this, probably most of you know all this, and it kind of varies anyway, you know, depending on how you work, you can shift this around and, and jump around. So let's talk about acquisition. How do we acquire content? How do we acquire these dome masters or create these dome masters? There are three main ways. We've got live capture, hybrid, where you're combining live capture with uh, computer graphics or visual effects techniques, and then you've got pure animation. So I'm gonna invite Robin Sip from Mirage 3D to talk about live capture. This is, he's uh, really an expert at this. Yeah, so in order to get uh, a 4K image on the dome shot with a fisheye, we would like to talk about some experiences this year. We've all been able to do this for the last five years with time-lapse, and this is how a time-lapse camera looks after a night in the Arctic. And, and, but, but you're not going to make your whole film time-lapse. You can move it a little bit on a dolly. I mean, this is kind of the shots we made with it after, after ten, 10 nights. In, you, you might have one lucky night and catch an aurora. But um, so we, we had a problem uh, last year. We had a, a commissioned show about um, the Arctic and the Sami people who live there. So we also needed um, 4K live action shoots outside, which we've only done in the green screen so far. And in the green screen, we use a red scarlet uh, with a a Sigma or a Canon lens and uh, make sure it's truncated, which is very important that uh, on east to west you have, you see your fisheye, but oops, top, some, top and bottom is, is clipped off, which in the green screen is not a problem. Um, and your actors are then still 4K and the rest is, um, is a virtual set, but outside you can't do it. So for outside we developed this rig where you have two reds, both do half the dome, and it works fine, but uh, not if you do 3D, because if you do 3D, you Imagine having four of these cameras, and then uh, yeah, the camera separation gets too much, too big. Uh, but we had a, a project where we, we had to do 2D as well. And for that, we also started to experiment with these uh, 10, 10, rig, uh, 10 channel GoPro cameras. So we worked on a, a teaser, which you'll see tonight. Some of these shots with, uh, with the different camera rigs will show tonight uh, in the dome. 
Um, and uh, the nice thing about such a lightweight rig, it's um, even with 10 of them or 14 of them, it's still just less than one and a half kilos. So you, you can use very lightweight material like, like gyps. Um, uh, just it's almost like a one or two man operation. The problem is uh, the stitching. Um, it's almost a gamble whether your shot is going to work or not. So if you, if you do a lot of nature shots where you can throw a lot away, then it's fine. If you um, really need to get that shot, it's really risky to do it this way. I mean, we had one shot that I really wanted to have in the show, and one of the animators spent two, two full days on, on to, get, to get the stitch right. And then we got another wobble in it now, and you'll see that tonight. So, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and you just don't know it in advance. So out of sheer desperation, we, we made this rig, because we had to, we signed up for making a 4K 3D live action film about Samis and, and Northern Lights, and um, there was just no camera out there. So we basically updated our, our rig, which we normally use in the green screen, which remember the top and the bottom are cut off, uh, with, with a few GoPros on the top. And um, it's about 10 kilos without the tripod. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's still portable, but it gets a little bit more difficult. So the, the most important thing is this is what the red sees. You know, this is the truncated fisheye shot. And we have two of those, one for the left eye, one for the right, right eye. And the GoPros have this image. You stitch that together. And then, of course, you combine it with the red footage. And then you have a, a, a 4K 3D live action shot. Um, and I, I didn't know any other way to do this. And uh, the advantage uh, as well with this rig is that you can actually have a moving platform so that it, um, it doesn't become a slideshow, so we can actually move the camera. So we had some, some reindeer sledging shots. Uh, the, the problem with, uh, with the rig is um, it's still five cameras and they need to be synchronized. We do that with sound. And it takes a lot of time to set up. And, and my worst experience last year was uh, to, to film a, a reindeer crossing, which happens once a year in October. They swim from island to island, a couple of hundred. And so these Samis, first of all, they charged me a tremendous amount of money to be able to film. And then they dropped me off. And somewhere here, an area of 500 meters, they're going to land. So I was waiting for them. And I just didn't see them coming. And, and at some point, I saw them way over there. <laughs> so I picked up this rig and had to run for yeah, probably 500 meters. And then I got to 30 meters away from them, and 30 meters is a lot of distance with a fisheye. They also warned me I couldn't scare the reindeer, that they would just go back in the water and, and swim back, and that they would die. So I, yeah, I have a shot 30 meters away, and, and it's not going to make it into the film. It's just uh, so, so portability is also important. And basically, a fisheye lens is not the best lens for, for wildlife. Uh, I learned that as well. Um, so this is a 3D rig with about 14 GoPros that you can do 3D. Um, with those cameras. The problem with this was, especially with the Hero 3, that uh, we couldn't use the highest resolution because the, the angles were a little bit big between the cameras. Um, so, but with the Hero 4, the problem was solved. And then uh, we're now experimenting with our own rig. This is not a product, this was just out, out of desperation again to, um, to add a few more cameras so that we can use the 4K resolution of the GoPro instead of the the 4K S resolution, which is a little bit stretched. Um, and so basically my, my, my whole story is there is not a good camera for 4K 3D especially, but uh, you can get around by using different, uh, yeah, different setups. Um, I mean, tonight I show you especially some, some parts from this India experience. The night shots are all done with the reds because the GoPros are really bad when it gets dark. Um, and, uh, but the whole show is a, a bit, bit of both. This, this rig still weighs less than one and a half kilos, so it is a potential to hang underneath uh, a drone. And, um, but uh, anyway, that's, that's a bit about state, what you can do today with, with 4K live, live capture.